Okay, so let us begin with our prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever enjoys consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Justin Martyr, pray for us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we're continuing our um, um, Acts of the Apostles. So um, now um, Saint Paul, actually, you know, he's coming back from, you know, uh, Greece area. And then he, right now he stopped at Miletus, okay, Miletus or Miletus, okay? So he did not want to stop in Ephesus because he was rushing back to go to Jerusalem for the feast of the, um, um, I think was it the Pentecost? Yeah, Feast of Pentecost, one of the three major feasts uh, in Judaism. And he was rushing back. So right now he took a ship from um, uh, Assos and he went all the way down to uh, Miletus. And now from here, what he does is that he's sending a letter, okay? He's sending a letter to the elders of Ephesus, okay? While he's waiting for the ship, okay? To go to uh, Jerusalem. And here it says, Paul exhorts Ephesian elders and say tribulations and chains um, awaits him in Jerusalem. Elders weep because they won't see Paul anymore. Well, they don't know about what's going to happen to Paul in Jerusalem yet, but they're sad to see him, okay, because he's going to go away for some time. So we're going to continue from Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 17 onwards, okay? So here he goes. Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders. From Miletus, he sent the message to Ephesus, asking the elders of the church to meet him. When they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the entire time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, enduring the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. I did not shrink from doing anything helpful, proclaiming the message to you and teaching you publicly and from house to house as I testify to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus. And now, as a captive to the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. But I do not count my life of any value to myself, if only I may finish my course and the misery that I receive from the Lord Jesus, ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus. Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will ever see my face again. Therefore, I declare to you this day that I am not responsible for the blood of any of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own son. I know that after I have gone, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Some even from your own group will come distorting the truth in order to entice the disciples to follow them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to warn everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves that I worked with my own hands to support myself and my companions. 
in all this, I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt down with them all and prayed. There was much weeping among them all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving especially because of what he had said, that they would not see him again. Then they brought him to the ship. Okay, so this farewell address to the elders of Ephesus. And before we go on, like, I just want to explain once again what elders mean. Elders in today's term basically means priests, just like, you know, Monsignor did or I. Uh, or other priests, you know, serving the church in our um, ICs or in the world. So um, when a, a bishop, so when a, mm, a episcopal uh, bishop, uh, in this case, the apostle Paul, he sets communities in, in different areas. He picks from among the people there, uh, elders, those who are to be in, in position of, you know, serving that community with liturgy, teaching, and also governing in some ways, you know, managing, or we could call it. So these elders basically are uh, what we know today as priests. So Paul called especially for the elders of Ephesus. There must have been a um, few of them because it, it was a large community. And uh, they're giving him Paul is giving them kind of a farewell talk, but also like, you know, encouragement, but also a little bit of a warning too, you know, because Paul understood, you know, even by then, you know, like there's a lots of um, enemies of the church, enemies of, of God's people. And, uh, you know, there's always, you know, arguments, distortions and, and you know, confusion and, and all these things happen, even in the early church. And it's still happening here today. Um, all churches, all parishes have uh, issues like this. And we, we all fight that, you know, and that's why we always have to be on guard, as Paul tells us, on guard, to be humble, to work hard, pray hard, and, you know, keep faithful to the teachings that Jesus gave us to the apostles. So Paul's address to the elders of Ephesus is the third great discourse related in Acts. You know, the first one was, you know, his... Um, a talk to the Jews in Pisidia and Antioch, and also the second one to the pagans at Athens, okay? So these are Paul's, you know, third great discourse. And it's a quite an emotional farewell to the churches which he has founded. And um, although, of course, Ephesus necessarily wasn't founded by Paul, but he did spend many years there, you know, during his ministry um, in the mission to, to to serve that community. The address divides into two parts. The first is from verse 18 to 27. It's a brief a resume of Paul's life of dedication to the church of Ephesus, which he founded and directed. And, you know, he talks about how, you know, how I was here and, you know, and I did so well and I served you and things like that. But also he talks about the difficulties, okay, we, we he, he experienced you know, during those uh, ministry. And he also hints of the difficulties that he's expecting to meet in the immediate future. And I don't know, maybe, maybe God gave him a warning. I don't know, but maybe he just had this gut feeling because, you know, all the cities that he's been, you know, visiting the past, there were always persecutions, you know, there were death threats, you know, they almost killed them, stoned them to death. So maybe he was kind of like, you know, probably next city that I go, same thing will happen. Maybe that's why. The two ter parallel section, 1821 and 2627, frame the central passage of the section verses 22, 25, okay? And the second section of the apostle uh, speaks movingly about the mission and role of elders. So this is more like a, a pep talk, if we could talk, right? If you could say. And the two of these recommendations, um, verses 20 to 31, 30 to 35, hinge on the central verse, verse 32, okay? 
The pathos, vigor, and spiritual depth of the discourse clearly show that it is Paul who is speaking. I don't think anybody else than Paul could speak that strongly and well and concise. Here we have the Paul of the letters addressing a community which has already been evangelized and inviting, inviting them to get to know their faith better and practice it better. And also I think, you know, to um, guard it, to guard it. Sometimes I don't, I don't think that we think about guarding our faith. Um, and I'm not saying guarding our faith, you know, in debates or arguments with people. I'm just that we guard our own faith from all these kind of confusions and um, misinformations. And because I believe that, see, a lot of Catholics, you know, we are misinformed. You know, I was talking to a, a high school student uh, recently, and he was asking me all these questions about our faith. He's, he's a wonderful young man. Like, he's very devout, very dedicated to, to faith. He, he has this eagerness to learn about our faith. And I hope one day maybe uh, if, if God calls him that he would answer God's call. But I was kind of listening to his question and, I, and I'm already sensing that somehow he has read or heard from people of all these misinformation. Um, and unfortunately this, this misinformation is, is kind of not Catholic understanding of Christianity, but it's a kind of more, uh, you know, Protestant understanding of our faith. And maybe it looks innocent and maybe it looks, you know, Christian even because, you know, Protestants are Christians. But, but when you go to like find details, um, it's very different and it does it does point a different direction. Like, let me just put it, it just points a different direction. Like, and, and I think that starts to cause a problem for us Catholics because, you know, once we kind of go into a different direction, then we're going to have a lot of trouble understanding our own faith, you know, our Catholic understanding of, of Christianity. And, um, and that is why we have to be careful. Like we have to be diligent, you know, is this information, you know, trustworthy? Like if somebody says, oh, you know, in the Bible, you know, it says that, for example, it says that, you know, Abraham lived or Adam lived thousand years. So it must be true. Okay. I mean, it's true. I mean, the Bible says he lived to up to about, about 800 or something years, but does the Catholic church teach that that is exactly the years of life that Adam had? I mean, what does the church say about that? right so we have to kind of be on guard and be careful about these informations and even informations that sometimes they claim that is catholic origin we have to be careful about that because sometimes they may be catholic source meaning a catholic person has said it but it's not necessarily the authentical authoritative teaching of the catholic church you know like no, like you have to be careful of that. Like what, even, even if it's a saying of a saint, okay? Even if a saint said, blah, blah, blah. See, the word of the saint, even though he's a saint and he's wonderful and everything, but that does not take precedence over the official authentic teaching of the church. The church's teaching trumps all other sayings, even of the saints. You see, because it's the church who, who decides what is authentically, you know, Christian teaching or not, the magisterium, right? So, because that's the magisterium's job, you know, the Holy Spirit gave the, the, the magisterium of the church that role, okay? That role, that's their role. So I think that is why we have to be careful to distinguish between what is the authentic teaching or doctrine or dogma of the Catholic Church or what all these you know, people say. We have to be careful of that. So we have to be on guard. We have to be on guard. So um, moving on, so verses 18 to 20. So Paul is not embarrassed to set himself as an example of how to serve God and the disciples in the cause of the gospel. So. I mean, that takes a lot of guts, you know, for somebody to be able to say, hey, listen, like model after me, okay? I, it takes a lot of guts. But I think Paul was able to say this, not because he was, you know, 
proud of himself, okay? It's not because of pride, but I think in all humility, he knew that it was the Holy Spirit working in him. It was the Holy Spirit who was guiding him and he was called to be a role model. So I think he just basically saying, listen, not that I'm great or not that I'm the best or anything, but Holy Spirit has been using me as an instrument. So, hey, you know, see me, I'm, I'm, I'm the evidence. I'm the evidence of God's work. So look at me, you know. Um, I think that's a really nice way of being a witness, okay? So we also, also should not be afraid to be able to say to people, look at me, not because I'm great, but look at me because God has done so much wonderful work through me. God is great. God is great. So please, I'm a witness. So look at me, you know, and see the evidence of God's grace. We should be able to, to, to do that, okay? Um, Paul has worked diligently out of love for Jesus and the brethren doing uh, his duty, uh, conscious that this kind of patient, persevering work is the way of perfection and holiness that God expects him to follow. So Paul here basically is saying that holiness is not some kind of magical, you know, things like levitation or, you know, causing miracles or seeing visions. See, Paul is talking about, listen, you know, being holy or living a life of holiness and perfection is living the life of service, life of diligent, you know, persistent, persevering, patient, kind of dutiful service, you know, serving Jesus and serving the brothers and sisters, you know, in Christ. Now, that is what, so he's kind of saying, this is what we need to be, okay? Not just as elders or priests, but also as Christians, also as Christians, you know? Um, of course, you know, ministerial priests like me, we, we serve the community, but, you know, normal lay people, you, you serve your own families, right? And you should do it diligently out of love, dutifully and consciously and patiently and, and perseveringly, you know, in a, in a way, because that is what perfection holiness is for, for, you know, the lay people, you know? So we have to kind of understand that holiness is not some magical stuff, okay? It's this real, you know, daily life, you know, stuff. The apostle has learned to imitate Christ both in his public life and in the long years of his hidden life, ever deepening in his love. So you may wonder, like, when, when did Apostle Paul learn all of this? Because, you know, Paul wasn't around, you know, in the early stages of Jesus' ministry. Well, after his encounter of Jesus in Damascus, he spent many years learning from like, you know, the fellow Christians, you know, the, those who are leading him and guiding him, especially those who were with Jesus, the eyewitnesses of Jesus. See, they taught Paul also, right? And we also believe that Paul received many, um, many, many gifts from God and Jesus himself. Uh, maybe, maybe he had lots of visions because uh, Paul also knows many of the hidden things about Jesus. St. Francis de Sales writes, those are spiritually greedy who never have enough of exercises of devotion. So keen are they, they say, to attain perfection as if perfection consisted in the amount of things we do and not in the perfection with which we do them. God has not made perfection to lie in the number of acts we do to please him, but in the way in which we do them. That way is to do the little we have to do according to our calling, that is to do it in love through love and for love. So a very important teaching from St. Francis de Sales is that, you know, at the same time, yes, diligency, you know, patience, and we have to do, you know, serve our community and things like that, but it's important. It's not just about the amount, okay? How much did I do, okay? How many hours did I do? It's also like, in what way are we doing them? In what way? So. If I'm serving our parish community, you know, um, 
12, 13 hours a day, okay, seven days a week. You know, some may say, wow, Father John, you're working so hard. You're working all these hours and wow, you are a good priest. Um, well, not really, because, you know, if I'm doing those many hours, but I'm always grumpy and mean and angry, most of the people of St. Jesus is like, no, he's not a good priest. He's mean. He's always angry. He's always upset. And, you know, rather, you know, I manage my time and work better. So I may work maybe eight hours or nine hours a day, maybe six days a week. But I do it in more happy, joyful, you know, because then people will say, yeah, Father John, he's a, he's a nice guy, he's pleasant, you know. You see, it's a big difference. And, and I know this because when I was working at my Korean parishes before, I used to do 13, 14 hours a day, seven days a week. And yes, I was always angry and upset and frustrated because I was stressed out. I was overworked, I was tired. And was I good in ministry? No. I was not, I was not good in ministry, but here um, I manage my time better and uh, I'm happier and, and I hope I'm doing a better job, but uh, I feel that I'm doing a better job than before, okay? So we have to do it well, like the way we do it, we have to do it with love, we have to do it with joy, we have to do it with smile. Yes, housework is a chore, it's, it's hard, but it's all in our hearts in our heads, in our hearts, you know, how we look at it. You know, if we do it with the love of God, knowing that this is going to, our service to our families is going to really please God. And it is really going to make God happy, you know, and also our family members happy. Maybe we need to kind of look at it in different ways, but we all, we usually just look at it as a burden and we all do that, but um, we kind of need to look in a different way. Not as a burden, but, but something to embrace. It's like when Jesus was looking at the cross that he had to carry, they say that he did not look at it as a burden, you know, because they say that when Jesus carried that cross, he embraced as if he was carrying a lover, like his lover. Like he was carrying the cross with so much love and tenderness. Why? Because that cross was us. You know, the cross that Jesus is carrying was us. He's carrying us, us sinners, us who need to be saved. You know, so of course Jesus embraced the cross with love. You know? So what we need to do is we need to look at our families. We need to look at our community. We need to look at our neighbors as, as our cross, as Jesus who embraced us first, who embraced us first. And so we must embrace our crosses with love. I think that is our goal. It's hard. I'm, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's hard. But I believe that that is what we need to do. St. Catherine of Siena understood our Lord to say to her something along the same line. I reward every good which is done, great or small, according to the measure of the love of him who receives the reward. So basically, Jesus is saying, it's not, it's not just about amount, but when it's done with love, you know, Jesus will reward us. Even how small that act of love might be, okay? As in his letter, Paul associates the idea of service with humility, tears, and fortitude to keep on working despite persecution. Now, once again, we could apply this in our daily lives, in our work. How many times we are called to humility at our workplaces? How many times are we called to tears at our workplaces? How many times are we called to fortitude or strength, you know, to keep on working despite persecution from our bosses, coworkers, customers, right? But the same way, we turn it around, look at our family. How many times 
You know, are we called to humility by our family members? Or how many times are we called to tears by our family members? Yeah, many, many times. And how many times, you know, do we actually get persecuted by our own people, by our own family members? Yeah, yeah. So when Paul is talking about this kind of attitude during service and, and, and ministry, it's not just talking about, you know, ministry and, and, and like how Paul was going as a mission or just as, you know, clergy doing ministry at church. No, he's talking about also the daily lives of us Christians trying to live our lives as Christians, you know, serving our family and serving our neighbors. Same thing. But Paul is basically saying, listen, this is who we are. This is who we are as Christians. Get used to this. Don't be afraid of this. Don't be afraid of humility. Don't be afraid of tears. Don't be afraid of persecution. It's just part of the program. It's just part of the package. Okay. Sorry. Jesus went through it himself. Paul went through it. St. Peter, all the other apostles went through it. All the other Christians ahead of us went through it. So, uh, well, we have to go through them too. Okay. The apostle's true treasure is humility, for it allows him to discover his shortcomings and at the same time teaches him to rely on God's strength. So humility is not beating yourself up. It's not beating yourself up. It's admitting, it's admitting that you're not perfect, or that we're not perfect, that we don't know everything. And it's actually, we are relying on God's strength. So we are, you know, praising God, elevating God, and lowering ourselves. That's what humility is. Reliance on God, okay? Not reliance on self, okay? St. Teresa says, this is St. Teresa of Avila, of course. The truly humble person will have a genuine desire to be thought little of and of condemned unjustly, even in serious matters. For if she desires to imitate the Lord, how can she do so better than in this? And no bodily strength is necessary here, nor the aid of anyone but God. So St. Teresa is teaching her nuns, but it applies to us too, right? So a truly humble person, okay, has a genuine desire to be thought little of. It's in this genuine, it's not pretending, you know. Sometimes we have false humility. We tell people, oh, no, I'm okay. Don't worry about me. Oh, yeah, you don't have to do anything for me. But then you go home and you sulk and you're so angry and you're like, you know, grinding your knife on the stone to backstab these people because, you know, they didn't treat you properly. No, that's not what she's saying. She's saying true, genuine humility when we really say, oh, no, don't pay attention to me. I don't need anything. You know, like we we're like, I'm, I'm no important, you know, I'm not, you know, kind of. But once again, not putting ourselves down, we're just simply saying, listen, if anything I do is good, it's because of God's grace. It's because God was so good to me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, I'm just God's servant. You know, that's the kind of humility that she's talking. Like Mother Mary, you know, what does she say? She says, I am the handmaid of the, I'm the servant of the Lord. Yeah, she just lowers herself, you know, when she was actually now the mother of God, right? She said, no, I'm just the handmaid of the Lord. And she's saying that to do this, okay, is just imitating Jesus, okay? We're not doing anything special, okay? We're just doing what Jesus did, but that's what he did. He humbled himself, even when he was unjustly condemned, unjustly condemned. Sometimes we get condemned unjustly too. Now, I personally have a little bit of different kind of opinion on this. Like this was more in a religious setting, in a convent, 
right? Like, so they were in a convent with a bunch of nuns and, and they're talking about how sometimes, you know, nuns, you know, unjustly condemn each other and things like that. So we got to also look at the context. Now, if you get sued by somebody in the society and they are suing you for something that you didn't do, don't just say, yes, I'll humbly just submit to it. No, like that's not what she's saying. Like if somebody sues you, you go to court and you fight, okay? Like that's not what they're saying. What, what this is more is more about like in your family, in your family, like if your mom or your dad or your sister or your brother or even your son or your daughter, they unjustly condemn you, of course you want to like fight them. But if you're in a family, maybe sometimes it's just better to just say nothing because our Lord said nothing, right? But because later on, later on, these people will realize and they come, oh, I'm sorry, I misjudged. I wrongly accused you, apologize. So, you know, that's what we're talking about in more context of the church, in the church or in a family, right? Not in the world, okay? In the world is a different story, okay? Somebody sues you, defend yourself. Get a lawyer, defend yourself. Don't just get sued, okay? And what St. Therese is saying is that how to do this, because it's not easy. It's not easy to stay quiet, okay? It can only be by help of God, God's help, okay? So that's why a truly humble person, they know that whatever good they do cannot do them for themselves. So they know that it's only from the help of God that could do it. So they don't take any praise. They just simply say, praise the Lord, praise God. You know, it's his doing, not mine. Verse 21, this very brief summary of Paul's preaching to the Jews and pagans mentions repentance and faith as inseparable elements in the new life Jesus confers on Christians. See, the reason why faith and repentance is so inseparable is because everybody had the wrong belief about God. So to have true faith in God, everybody must repent. That's just simple as that. Okay, it's not, it doesn't mean that everybody's a criminal and they should be hanged or killed. No, everybody had wrong faith about God because nobody was able to truly tell us about God except Jesus. Okay, not even Moses. Sorry, like Moses is great. Abraham is great. But nobody but Jesus could tell us directly and clearly who God is and what we need to do. So, Everybody needed to repent because they believe God in the wrong way, okay? So we must repent. And, and sometimes even as Christians, once again, because we, we get misinformed and we believe in wrong information, we also, that's why, continually need to repent because sometimes our faith gets misdirected too, okay? So faith and repentance always goes hand in hand. Origen writes, it is good to know that we will be judged at the divine judgment seat, not on our faith alone, as if we had not to answer for our conduct, nor on our conduct alone, as if our faith were not to be scrutinized. What just justifies is our uprightness on both scores. And if we are short on either, we shall deserve punishment. So basically, Origen is saying, look, when we get judged by Jesus, he's not just going to say, did you believe or not believe? Or did you do good or bad? You know, it's all in combination. You know, it's all combination. And, and he's saying, we, know, we must be good on both, you know, both accounts. Because even back then, in Origen's time, there were there are people who are arguing, oh, you know what, your conduct, you know, how how you live your life doesn't really matter as long as you have faith. Okay, faith alone. We, we hear this a lot, right? Like in this Protestants, basically, Martin Luther always says stuff like faith alone and things like that, right? Well, he didn't invent it. I'm sorry, it was there a long, long time ago, even the early church. And origin basically is clarifying, hey, no, we're not going to be judged by faith alone. Okay. Also, we also don't get judged by our conduct alone. It takes both. Okay. Because there has been some, some Catholics 
who extremely go the other way and say, oh, it doesn't matter if you, if you don't believe in God. All you have to do is just be a good person. Oh. It's not that simple. You know, it's not that simple. You know, God will take everything into account, but as Christians, okay, we're not talking about unbelievers or non-believers here. As Christians, we have to have faith and we have to have right conduct, okay? Okay? For us Christians. For non-Christians, God will look at them a little bit differently because if it is not their fault that they're not Christians, then how can they be judged the same way as God judging us, right? Okay? So for example, like people in, in an island who never heard Jesus, well, it's not their fault that they didn't know Jesus, right? Like maybe it's, it's our fault because we didn't teach them about Jesus, right? So it's different for non-Christians, but for Christians, it's faith and conduct together. We have to have that together. The presence of grace and faith in the soul equips it to fight the Christian fight, which ultimately leads to rooting out sins and defects, okay? So we need grace. It can't, we can't do it by ourselves, but we also need faith. Okay, we need to have trust in God, trust in God's grace, okay, to fight sins and defects. Origen says, from the very day faith enters your soul, battle must be joined between virtues and vices. Prior to the onslaught of the word, vices were at peace within you, but from the moment of the word begins to judge them one by one, a great turmoil arises and a merciless war begins. For what partnership have righteousness and iniquity? This is really interesting because this is really true. You know, when a person says, ah, I'm talking about a Catholic person, says, ah, you know what, I'm not going to practice my faith. I'm just going to live my life the way I want. I'm just going to stay home, watch football on Sunday, you know, like, let's say the person is so much at peace because there's nothing hindering him, okay, no conscience, you know, he's not living by his conscience, but as soon as he says, oh, maybe, maybe I should go to church, then he goes to church, and he realizes, oh my gosh, I'm doing all these things wrong, I have to change the way of my life, and it gets more complicated, more difficult, so what happens is that usually they say, oh, you know what, actually, I was at more peace, it was easier when I didn't go to church, and uh, sometimes they you know, stop coming to church. It happens. It happens. Um, see, living an authentic Christian life, it's not easy. It's hard work. It's hard work. And Origen is basically saying that, that it is hard work and we must persevere through it. Verse 22, the apostle is convinced that God is guiding his steps and watching over him like a father, but he's also unsure about what lies ahead. This uncertainty about the future is part of the human condition. Okay, so don't get me wrong. Paul was a wonderful saint, but we must also remember he was as human as we are. Okay, so he also did not have insights into the future. He had doubts. He had fears and anxieties, right? But he did. He did have faith in God, okay? And so we struggle too. You know, we have faith in God, but we're also worried about the future. So it's a battle. It's a battle. But we must remember that we must trust God more than being worried about the future. St. John Chrysostom says, grace does not work on its own. It respects men in the actions they take. It influences them. It awakens and does not entirely dispel their restlessness. So sometimes people think like grace is like once again like something like magic when we receive God's grace, like we become like we go into this zone, maybe like we're not afraid of anything, that we're like superhuman. It doesn't work like that. Like grace helps us to be a good human being, but we are a human being, you know. Um, don't think that we we could just get away, you know, without putting our efforts and work into it. No, we must put our efforts and work into it also. So that is why St. Teresa always says, when you pray, pray as if everything depends on God. So you're asking God to give you all the grace you need. But when you're doing it, do it as if it 
is totally dependent on you, okay? So when we are doing the actual work, we must do our best, that's what she say. Because sometimes we go the opposite way. When we pray, we pray as if everything depends on us. God, you know me, I need this, give me this, blah, blah, blah. Otherwise, I'm not gonna talk to you, you know? And then when we actually doing something, we actually do it as if everything depends on God. We like, we don't put effort into it. We do, you know, we're lazy about it, but then we say, oh God, you know, give me a good success. Well, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen like that. Vatican II also says the true minister of Christ is conscious of his own weakness and labors in humility. He searches to see what is well pleased to God and bound as it were in the spirit. He is guided in all things by the will of him who wishes all men to be saved. He is able to discover and carry out that will in the course of his daily routine. This is really important because recently Pope Francis were, was talking to, to the priests and the message that he sent to the priests was that, that we priests, priests must remember that we too also are penitents when we're listening to, you know, confessions. Because sometimes priests, there are some priests who forget that they were, they are also sinners. And they kind of talk to, you know, uh, penitents as if, you know, they're perfect. And that's not good, right? Pope Francis even said, like, if, if that's the attitude you have, it's probably better for, for you, for that priest to not hear confessions. And, um, and I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. And I, and I remind myself also that when I'm hearing confessions that, uh, you know, like I'm not God, you know, I'm not God. I'm just a priest, God's instrument, also a sinner. And I'm just here to, you know, perform the sacrament, right? Like I'm not the judge, you know, I'm not here to, you know, uh, punish somebody. No, that's not my job. All I'm doing is, you know, trying to do God's work, you know, to, to give this person God's forgiveness and, and, and grace, right? It took me some time to, to understand that too. It, it took me some time. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think what Pope Francis is saying is very true and it, it comes from Vatican II. Pope Francis did not just make it up, you know? Um, we have to be ministers of Christ in humility, okay? Conscious of our own weakness, okay? Our own failures and our own sinfulness. And this applies to, I think, same way, when parents are dealing with their children. Sometimes parents think that, you know, that they have to be authoritative, but in, instead they become like authoritarian. Um, being authoritative is good. You know, you give them good guidelines, expectations, and you give them rewards and also, you know, uh, penalties. But a lot of times, you know, parents kind of become authoritarians, meaning like they become like dictators my way or highway. If you don't follow me, get out of the house. Sometimes parents do that. Like, if you don't listen to me, you're not gonna get inheritance. Ah! Um, that's not a Christian way. That's not Christian way. Um, parents also need to approach their children with humility, teaching them, listen, mom and dad, we're not perfect, but we're trying our best and this is God's teaching, and that is what we're gonna try our best to keep them. You know, approach it in that way, okay? Verse 23, St. Jose Maria Escriva says, no man, whether be a Christian or not, has an easy life. To be sure, at a certain time, it seems as though everything goes as we planned, but this generally lasts for only short time. Life is a matter of facing up to difficulties and of experiencing in our hearts both joy and sorrow. In, it is in this forge that a person can acquire fortitude, patience, magnanimity, and composure. 
naturally the difficulties we meet in our daily lives will not be as great or as numerous as St. Paul encountered. We will, however, discover our own meanness and selfishness, the sting of sensuality, the useless, ridiculous smack of pride, and many other failings besides. So very many weaknesses. But are we to give in to discouragement? No, not at all. Together with St. Paul, let us tell our Lord, for the sake of Christ, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I think, you know, we need to kind of tell this message to our, um, you know, catechumens when they're joining us, the Catholics, that Sometimes, sometimes I think people come in thinking that being a Christian means having an easier life on earth. Um, as we know, no, that's not the case, right? Um, Christians don't have an easier life. Sometimes Christians have more difficult life, um, but that's just, that's just life. Um, we Christians, because we're trying to become better, we're trying to live by our conscience, and we're trying to do the right thing, we sometimes have to endure more, you know, persecution or more obstacles or more, you know, um, opposition. Uh, it, it's like we're, we're going upstream instead of going downstream because, you know, if you kind of look at it this way, like, it, just like salmon goes upstream to lay eggs, like we're going upstream, okay? Across the current. That's why it's so hard because if we go down the current, there's nothing there left but death, okay? We have to go upstream to, to bring life, to, to enter into life. So it is hard. It is hard to, to live as a Christian. But once again, it's not because we're bad people or anything like that. It's not because God is uh, testing us or giving us a hard time to make fun of us or because he's mean and he wants us to suffer. No, it's just the way it is. It's life. Our, our world is going downwards. We're going upwards against the current, and it's more difficult. Verse 24, Paul has come to love Jesus Christ so much that he gives himself no importance. He sees his life as having no meaning other than that of doing what God wants him to do. When we hear something like this, we kind of go Ooh, a little bit cringy because we are like afraid. So it basically means like, I'm going to hate myself. No. But the funny thing is, because when you really love God, what God's going to tell you is this, that love yourself, basically. When you want to do God's will, he's going to say, okay, John, like, do what you want. The funny thing is, for example, like, I realized this, is that I, I really resisted going to the seminary because I thought that's what I knew. I knew that was what God wanted me to do, but that was not what I wanted to do. But after I realized that I also want what God wants, he made me realize that what he wants is what I want. I don't know if I'm really making a sense, but when I was in the seminary, I kind of dragged myself into it. But at the end of the seminary years, like I was the one who loved it more. Like I'm enjoying it more. So I knew why God called me to be a priest because he knew that I would be happy. He knew that I would be happy in the priesthood. So I believe in my whole heart when God asks us to do something, he's not asking us to do that for him. He's asking us to do it for us, for our sake. So we need to trust him and we follow him. Paul sees holiness as a constant, uninterrupted striving towards his encounter with the Lord. All the great fathers of the church have followed him in this. For example, St. Gregory of Nyssa says, on the subject of virtue, for example, we have learned from the apostle himself that only limit to perfection of virtue is that there is no limit. This fine noble man, uh, this divine apostle, never ceases when running on the course of virtue to strain forward to what lies ahead. He realizes it dangerous to stop. Why? Because all good by its very nature is unlimited. It, its only limit is where it meets its opposite. Thus, the limit of life is death, of light, darkness, and in general of every good, its opposite. Just as the end of life is the beginning of death, so too, if one ceases to follow the path of virtue, one is beginning to follow the path of vice. 
I think if I want to comment like one thing about this is that this is so true. So once again, I try to explain to you that we're going upstream, you know, with the river flowing downstream. If we stop paddling, we're not going to stay put. We're going to go backwards. Okay. So in our, in our life as a Christian, we need to continually paddle nonstop. Because otherwise, we're not going to go forward. We're not going to stay put. We're going to go backwards. Okay, so we're going against the current, right? So constant paddling, constant struggle, constant, constant, you know, effort in prayer and, and in good works and in our spiritual life. Like we have to constantly paddle. Verse 26 in Beat says, he considers himself innocent of the blood of the disciples because he has not neglected to point out to them their defects. Paul not only preached the gospel to them and educated them in the faith, he also corrected their false putting into practice the advice he gave them to the Galatians. If a man is overtaking any trespass, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Look to yourself, lest you too be tempted. So basically, he's commenting on the part that when, you know, St. Paul says, you know, I'm innocent of your blood, meaning he's kind of saying, listen, I taught you everything. I taught you everything you need to know. I told you the truth. I gave you all that I received from Jesus and from other apostles. I've handed down to you everything. So now it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. Like you're not my child anymore. Like you're an adult. You have to be responsible for your own life, for your own actions. So go and do it. I think that's what St. Paul is trying to tell these elders and also to us too. St. Jose Maria Spiva says, a disciple of Christ will never treat anyone badly. Error he will call error, but the person in error he will correct with kindness. Otherwise, he will not be able to help him to sanctify him. This is very important. It's not enough to point out mistakes of others, but we have to do it with kindness, okay? Because otherwise, it's not going to help them. It's not going to help them. So that's why sometimes, you know, if I feel that I will not be able to correct someone's error in kindness, I just keep my mouth shut. Because it's actually better to not say anything, to say it in, on, in a mean way, and make it worse, and make it worse, okay? Verse 28, using a metaphor often found in the New Testament to describe the people of God, Paul describes the church as a flock, that is, guardians or bishops as shepherds. Vatican II says, the church is a sheepfold, the sole and necessary gateway to which in Christ is also a flock of which God foretold that he would himself be the shepherd and whose sheep, although watched over by the human shepherds, are nevertheless at all times led and brought to pasture by Christ himself, the good shepherd and prince of shepherds who gave his life for his sheep. Um, I, I think another reason why Jesus uses a lot of the shepherd and flock metaphor is because I think sheep are very stubborn. Um, and they don't listen to the shepherds all the time. And maybe that's why he's calling a sheep too sometimes. And uh, I think sheep can be a little bit dumb too. So maybe that's why. But anyway, um, that's just my kind of personal little um, thought on that. In the early days of the church, the term priest and bishop had not yet become defined. They both refer to sacred ministers who have received the sacrament of priestly order. The last part of the verse refers to Christ's sacrifice. Through his redeeming action, the church has become God's special property. The price of redemption was the blood of Christ. Paul VI says that Christ, the Lamb of God, took himself the sins of the world and he died for us, nailed to the cross, saving us by his redeeming blood. The Council of Trent speaks of this when it presents the redemption of the act of his beloved only begotten, our Lord Jesus Christ, who merited justification for us by his most holy passion on the wood of the cross and may satisfaction for us to God the Father. Verse 30, errors derived not only from outsiders, they're also the product of members of the church who abuse their position as brethren and even as pastors, leading the people astray by taking advantage of their goodwill. 
We encounter this all the time, even today, and it's going to go on and on and on until the end of the judgment day. So we need to continue to pray. We need to continue to always be on guard. We need to continue to be always, you know, uh, on watchful lookout and, um, and not, not get too scandalized by it. Um, like, don't have an expectation that that there's not going to be some corruption or some, you know, problems in our church. It's, we're always going to have, a, we always have, see, even Jesus had problem with his own apostles, right? Judas and Peter and all the other guys running away and stuff like that, right? So let us not be scandalized by that. It's just part of life. It's part of our church. Um, but the church is holy, not because we are holy as human beings, but because God is holy, because God, the Holy Spirit is in within our church. And, and Jesus promised that our church will survive, that our church will be perfected, our church will even beat hell, right? So that's why we need to trust in Jesus' words and continue to be believe and be hopeful and encourage and forgive and and embrace, you know, but at the same time, be on guard. Errors, mistakes, problems will be there. It will be with us. St. Pete says, it is of this that John writes, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Okay. Verse 31, St. John Chrysostom says, here he shows that he actually taught them and did not proclaim the teaching only once, just to ease his conscience. Paul did not avoid the pastoral work which fell to him. He set an example of what a bishop, a priest, should be. St. Gregory Nisa also said, those who rule the community must perform worthily the task of government. There is a danger that some who concern themselves with others and guide them toward eternal life may ruin themselves without realizing it. Those who are in charge must work harder than others, must be humbler than those under them, must in their own lives give an example of service and must regard their subjects as a deposit of which God has given them in trust. It's very important for us to remember that bishops are given the authority to govern the church, meaning that, see, they're not just there to pray, okay? They're not just here to pray. They're here to be leaders. You know, they're responsible for the community. The reason is because if they don't lead, if they don't govern, somebody else will. Somebody else will. And it's happened in all community. If we priests of this parish, which the bishop gave us the authority to govern this parish. If we don't do it, somebody else is going to. You know, somebody else than us is going to govern this church. And it might be better, I don't know, but I don't think so. It's not going to be better. It's going to be worse, right? So, for example, if mom and dad in a family says, you know what, I'm not going to set any guidelines. I'm not going to govern the house. Who's going to rule? Somebody is going to maybe maybe a child is going to rule the house or govern the house somebody is going to take advantage of that vacancy and take control of the situation so as parents it's your duty to govern your own house your own family okay as priests it is our duty to govern this parish as bishops it is their duty to govern their diocese and as a pope he is to govern the church that is duty but once again, with humility, with kindness, with love, okay? Not as a dictator, okay? Verse 32, St. Gregory Nisa, it is not right for Christians to give such importance to human action as they think that all the laurels depends on their efforts. Their expectation of reward should be subject to the will of God. Basically, we do our best, but we leave the results to God and the rewards to God also. All we do is we do our best, okay? Verse 33 to 35, St. John Paul II says, the teachings of the apostles of the Gentiles, they have, they have key importance for the morality and spirituality of human work. They are an important complement to the Greek, though discrete gospel of work that we find in life and parables of Christ in what Jesus did and taught. And you know that saying where, Jesus, uh, where Paul said that Jesus said, it is better to give than to receive. Okay, verse 35. 
it's not recorded in the Gospels. Um, so does it mean that Paul was wrong? No, probably it was true. Probably it was true. So we, even today, we, we say that right? it's better to, it's better to give than to receive. And Paul says it was actually our our Lord Jesus who said that. Okay. Although yes, they're not found in the Gospels. Verse 36, for Christians, every situation is suitable for prayer. Clement of Alexander writes, a Christian prays everywhere and in every situation, whether it be when talking, uh, taking a walk or in the company of friends or while it's resting or at the start of some spiritual work. And when he reflects in the interior of his soul and invokes the Father with unspeakable groaning. So I know many people have asked, you know, the same question, which is, is pertinent to everybody. Everybody goes through it. Father. When I'm praying, when I'm at church, I'm always distracted. It's a little bit different, but kind of in the same line. What you need to do is just take God with you into your distraction, okay? Which means that you should take God with you in every areas of your daily lives. Brushing your teeth, God, the toothpaste doesn't taste good, okay? When you're taking a shower, oh God, you know, not in a disrespectful way, but always converse with God, converse with Jesus, converse with Mother Mary every day of your lives. When we try to do that, we're going to be praying everywhere all the time. And that's beautiful because Jesus said, pray unceasingly, pray all the time. That's the command of our Lord. Verse 37, they kiss Paul to show their affection for him and how they move they are. This is not true. Uh, this is not the liturgical kiss of peace, okay? In the East, kisses are a common expression of friendship and good manners like handshaking in the West. So um, this is kind of awkward way that they kind of put it because maybe in the East, kisses are a common expression of friendship and handshaking in the West. Well, if I say the East, I'm, I'm usually thinking of like East Asia, like Korea, Japan, China. We don't kiss, okay? Like we don't kiss anybody, okay? <laughs> we don't even handshake, we bow, okay? Oh, thank you, hello, hello, no touch, don't touch me, yes, right? That's what we do. Um, of course, kisses is more now European thing, I would say, European thing, like Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, they always kiss people, mwah, 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 you know, like even three times, and they even kiss just a stranger you met on the street, you know, so that's just the way of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, expressing uh, themselves. So when Paul kissed the elders on the cheek, it, it was not like, the kiss of peace that we have in our mass, although we don't kiss each other anymore either right? because of the cultural context. But basically, it's just a, it's a way of saying farewell, okay? Sorry, this is part of um, last week's um, presentation. I don't know why it wasn't erased, but that's the end of our presentation today. Um, so now Paul is going to be moving from Miletus to all the way down to Jerusalem. Okay, So that's the uh, end of his third missionary journey when he arrives in uh, Jerusalem. Okay. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, then let us end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray for our Holy Father and for his intentions. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as he was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in the peace of Christ. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention and joining us today. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father John. Thank you. Thank you, Father John. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Father John. See you next week. Yeah. See you tomorrow. <laughs>